I'm Caroline Searcy. Welcome to a new week of Thoroughbreds Argo, helping horses find great lives away from the racing industry. Coming up on this week's show, we bring you the high stakes kick up workshop in Sydney with key industry stakeholders formulating plans to safeguard racing amongst concerns for the welfare of our thoroughbreds. Thoroughbred Breeders Australia with another group of fast track students graduating with the world at their feet. And Anna Connors with a beautiful mare in Arrowfield Stud Strapper's Stories. That's all coming up on Thoroughbreds Argo. Kick Up is an organisation that spreads the facts about the racing industry into the outside world. They held a high stakes workshop here at Royal Randwick in Sydney last week, bringing together key stakeholders from around Australia to find a way forward to ensure the progress of the racing industry in our modern society. Welfare, workforce and perception. The three greatest threats to our industry. Problems we have been hearing about for years, with solutions appearing to be stuck in the bureaucratic web. The impact, we wait. And while we wait, we let someone else dictate our fate. Partly because we are a wealthy sport, there's a big bullseye on our back. So we do have to be basically showing everything we are doing to get to zero. Like the road toll, we'll probably never get there, but here's the journey that we're going on. It's all very well to get in a room and discuss it all, but we've got to take away some uh, actionable uh, goals that we can achieve and it's about changing that narrative. I think the greatest thing about today is we had many different stakeholders from many different areas of the industry all converge on the one room today and the, most, the greatest thing to come out of this was everyone was so comfortable in sharing their experiences, what they're doing in their relative spaces to improve our industry um, and they've also committed to doing things to help better our industry. Well, Vin Cox, of course, from Godolphin, who have been such big supporters of, of Kick Up, he was saying, you know, it's about changing the narrative. You know, we have so many people now that are anti-racing or they have different ideas about whether it be to do with wagering or horse welfare or, you know, horses being injured on the track. But, but changing the narrative, it takes, you know, the whole community, as we saw today, to really do that. It takes a community effort to change that narrative and where we've found ourselves is in a public perception crisis, so the public are challenging us. The anti-racing community are really consistent in their messaging. They have a large distribution network and they've been, it's been a one-way narrative for far too long. So the purpose of Kick Up was to get, and, and today, was to get everyone in the same room and work out how can we change that narrative together. What messages can we say together to shift the needle in the public space? So things like, you know, how do we get those good news stories out there? Everyone share those good news stories with Kick Up. We, we take the analogy of Kick Up being the glue and, uh, to share those good news stories. So today was a really great experience to get many different stakeholders in the room, hear about their experiences, hear about the good news stories, hear about how they can help us get that good message out there and change the narrative. And a lot of it too, as we talked about in the separate pillar, talking about media, and it is about um, you know the PRAs and people that are no principal racing authorities. So you had them from different states of Australia, people from race clubs, people from all sorts of different areas in racing. And things such as, you know, from, from Racing Victoria, Sean was talking about talking to the stewards about the language involved in, in stewards' reports, not using, you know, catastrophic or, you know, some of the language we, we need to share with media to, to try and not say a horse broke down or, or is being broken in. Or There are different ways that we can approach it as an industry. Exactly. And the benefit of getting all the different stakeholders together where we, we were hearing different uh, experiences and stories from their lines of work. So Sean was very 
forthcoming with how they are, um, what work they are doing. So stewards' reports, which are public documents access, they've worked to ensure that that language is palatable, um, because I believe that, and, and we all believe that, we have our own language within racing. If you mm. and breeding, if you weren't born in it or you don't work in it, how can you understand some of the phrases that we knew, uh, use? So we discussed, you know, how can we either update that or educate on in that space, um, so that when we are talking to the public, it is inclusive language. And you know, we learn about some of the things that are, that are coming to play for some of the anti-racing community in terms of approaching sponsors mm -hmm. of race clubs and you know if a horse um, you know is injured in a race and they sort of say how can you sponsor racing I mean that's something that the industry needs to know that that's how how sort of um, you know progressed it is to actually be trying to take sponsorship away from the industry. Exactly. So with the antis, it's not just the picketing and protest rallies like we believe it is. They are doing things and being consistent in their messaging. So for example, contacting the decision makers um, and the periphery impacts are huge. Um, the periphery impacts on sponsors, on ambassadors, on the education space, in the government. It is really alarming how long this one way narrative has gone on for and the consistency in messaging uh, and that's something that Kick Up is going to work on. It's to present the racing side of it uh, with actual facts and be consistent, just as consistent um, in that messaging and encourage our communities to be consistent in that language as we as we work to really shift that narrative. One of the things that we often get thrown at is that you know horse dies every two and a half days. But you know, a lot of the people, a lot of people don't realise that the majority of horses die in paddock accidents. But that doesn't happen to thoroughbreds because they are so well cared for that they are kept in the stable. They they go out for their exercise and brought back in. It's the same with colic. Actually, kills 27% of the normal horse population, but only 7% of the thoroughbred population because they have a vet that they can call. You know, that'll be there within an hour at max. We need to sort of, I guess, as you say, it's telling the stories, but it's also, you know, getting out of the bubble that we're all in as well, to be able to get it to the right people, to communicate. You know, there are so many great stories and so much education going on about rehoming and retiring horses. Exactly, and, that, and that's going to be um, working amongst our networks. And it, it really, today, we encourage people, please share your good stories with us so that we can get it out there, or we might know an area where we can push that even further to show the public what we are doing and how we are doing it. and. As you say, we are really in our racing bubble and it was really great uh, to hear today from a racing fan what is happening in that corporate space because we work in racing. I personally don't have experience in that corporate space so it was really important for us all to hear what is happening in, those, in that corporate space um, and cut, yeah, coming together today and working out what we can do. Fantastic. Oh, Julia, well, welcome as the, the vice chair now of Kick Up. It's been an incredible organisation that Vicky Leonard founded and, and great young people you're working with, but combined now with your experience in the industry. Yeah, I'm really happy to be involved with them. Uh, the thing I loved about it was already in existence and why reinvent the wheel. They're actually making inroads and they've got a presence and they're respected. Why go and create something new? where we've got the opportunity where we can combine everybody under one banner to at least get one voice. And, and that's the beginning of this, because at the moment we've got too many voices with not enough the same message. You have your own farms, you've bred lots of horses, raced horses, you retire and look after uh, thoroughbreds as well. So how have you seen it changing now? The conversation has changed in recent years, hasn't it, with so many young people and, and just that the whole societal sort of push against racing from some quarters is far stronger than it's ever been. Well, when I was still at the ATC, the Young Members Advisory Group, they were very bullish about how it was nearly, really impossible to get their friends to come. They were the converted, they couldn't get their mates to come racing with them. The other side of it is from a sponsorship aspect, that the sponsorship departments in all the race clubs were now getting such pushback for some people about their participation. We need a, an outward facing approach and whether it's going to be we find people to become our ambassadors who have got that profile. Nearly every bit of medical research or philanthropy have a face off and I think that always helps as well having a presence in a bigger audience. So maybe we should be looking at that as well. Everyone's got the same appetite to actually make change which is good and it's been a while since we've had that sort of great collaborative feel in a room. It's now how we marshal that and get something really positive out of it, which I think we will. It's the beginning of a really interesting journey. It was quite specific that we targeted 50 people to invite to this, and that number is one that Malcolm Gladwell, as one of the most more famous um, social change authors, 
has promoted as the number that's not too big, not too small, that allows change to start from. I'll get into why that's important um, as we go through, because co coming together as a community is precisely how we're going to actually make this change happen. And Vicky Leonard, of course, the founder of KickUp, she has some great, you know, statistics. And, and in terms of strategy and, and the way that you get the information out to, to more people and make it actually effective, the information that you're sending out. And some of the other stats in terms of, you know, the amount of people, you know, the kids, the amount of, of time they spend being taught by teachers. And if the teachers are anti-racing, then we're, we're really on the back foot. So it is fascinating. KickUp has a lot of information already and a lot of actual statistics. Exactly. So. The, the model of KickUp is it's a bottom-up approach powered by the younger generation and the purpose of KickUp is to not be the opposition to the antis, however it is to present the facts of our industry and allow, we, we talked about the analogy of a bell curve where you have the left um, who are the antis and we can't convert them, they are not KickUp's target market. Then in the middle of the bell curve, you know, that middle can be swayed left or right depending on what they see, hear or experience. So the point of KickUp is not to try and convert the, the bell curve on the left, for want of a better phrase. It's to present the actual facts and allow that middle bell curve to make form their own opinion of our industry. And the way forward, what, what are the plans, I guess, coming out of this? There's a, there's a lot to digest from today. A lot to digest. It, it was really exciting to get everyone in the room. So the purpose of this workshop was to prepare ourselves um, for, the, for the upcoming carnival. This won't be a one-off workshop. It will be uh, a, a series of workshops to ensure that we are hearing what's happening out and about and um, how we can create different assets to help our communities. So. From today, the way forward is that we disseminate the information, we figure out what are the deliverables and how can our industry help kick up, put that out there to change the narrative. Some great ideas there and plenty of passion to promote and celebrate our great racing industry. Coming up, that industry is in great hands too as we celebrate the fast track graduation ceremony with more students coming into the breeding industry. Thoroughbred Breeders Australia's Fast Track program celebrated the graduation of another group of students in Scone in the Hunter Valley of New South Wales last week. They receive a Certificate 3 in official qualification and they inspired the new group of students about to take up their stud placements. On behalf of Thoroughbred Breeders Australia, I would like to provide a warm welcome to everyone who has come to celebrate our Fast Track graduating class of 2022. It's really pleasing to see uh, the 11 graduates that we've got here tonight. Uh, to get to the end of the course, great to see their employers here tonight, their family members here tonight, and they should really feel proud of themselves uh, to get through the year. We know that stud, stud life is not always easy, it's not always straightforward. It's late nights, it's early mornings, it's hard work. Uh, so to get through to the end of that 12 months is, is a big achievement, so uh, I congratulate you all. Maddie, it's been a great ceremony for these students. They've achieved so much in 12 months. It's really great to see it celebrated. Yes, it really is. And honestly, Caroline, I could not be more proud of these students. Um, obviously, I'm fortunate enough. This is my first year looking after these students. And it's been extremely rewarding from my end to see just how much each student has grown and developed over the last 12 months. To see since they've put on their first halter to where they have are uh, right now. Um, it's an amazing accomplishment and each one should be so extremely proud of themselves because I, myself, TBA um, and their farms, we're all extremely proud of all these students. 
And looking at the graduates, tell us about how you see their development through the year. Do you see them change their perceptions of the industry and what they want to do? Oh, 100%. And it's almost like looking at a foal going to the sale. Um, the students themselves, that first day, they're nervous wrecks. They're um, very quiet. And even by the end of that four-week block, they've um, engaged as a group. They're, they connect. And then from that four weeks, they then go on to onto the farms where they grow and develop throughout the year. The growth that they um, showcase on their farms, the learnings that they create, the moments they have from their first foalings, from handling stallions to when they're in the sales ring. It's just amazing to watch and be a small part of that journey. Of course, there are two reasons for having these stories on Thoroughbreds Ago. One is regarding horse welfare, which we'll touch on shortly, but also this program has a huge following in the equestrian world. So it's interesting seeing people with some horse background really wanting to know more about the thoroughbred breeding industry. Definitely, and we even have students who have never touched a horse in their life before, and that's um, a couple of students included in this graduating class who have come from careers such as pilots, come from the Defence Force, as you've spoken with Jimmy before, and they have had this opportunity to really kickstart a career in the thoroughbred industry and see what it's all about, to actually experience what the thoroughbred industry has to offer, what career pathways that it has to provide, and also give them an insight to even if it's not where they see themselves in the future, but it allows them to see what the thoroughbred industry is about and to educate themselves on what can be possible in this industry. And from a thoroughbred care and welfare angle, the common theme is that with the right education for humans who will be rearing thoroughbreds, that transfers to better educated horses, which is so vital for them transitioning into off-track careers. Oh, 100%. And I think even giving them that insight to, if they go into a career such as within the vet nurse uh, pathway or nominations or something that's not as hands-on on the farm, you always have that understanding from that 12 months what a farm involves and how to actually relate with farmers, with managers and people in the industry and what they put into their horses and the care and love that they show to all of their horses on the farm. Uh, it's been a bit of a journey, I'd say. Yeah, the 12-month placement on Beamer. Been to a couple of sales, took part in the following season. Uh, a lot of yearling prep, a bit of a journey, like I said, and loved every bit of it. Um, I was looking for a career change, something like a little bit un more unusual than just the general um, traineeships, and I came across the Fast Track um, ad on Facebook, and yeah, it just sparked an interest. Going to sales and uh, learning there's other branches that you can take in, within the industry and that's not just stud work but there's all different things like bloodstock work and uh, photos and videos and anything, yearling managers, broodman managers, there's a whole range of jobs that you can work yourself towards. The routine structure of working on farm and within the industry fitted well with my past experiences in defence and I think it, it definitely helped me through the uh, time on the Fast Track program. I'm looking to stay at Swetnam Stud for probably another year at least and then kind of just see where that takes me. I'm kind of open to anywhere in the industry at this point, so yeah. This graduation means so much to them, doesn't it? You can see how rewarding it is for them to have actually completed the Fast Track course. Yes, absolutely. And it's so wonderful to see the families get involved um, and come along and support their uh, children, friends, partners, and also the farms, the representatives, and not only farms that are within the program that have had a trainee this year, but also other industry bodies and people involved within the program that have supported for field trips, uh, careers expos, and everything in between there, because it really does take the whole industry to get involved in this program to make it such a success that it is. Three students, in particular Taylor, who worked in the mines to get some income behind her and had an off-track standard bread. Caitlin already had off-track thoroughbreds as well. And Zach, who worked at Lindsay Park and is going to sweat in them studs. Some great students coming through. Yes, and it's wonderful to see such a variety of a group um, coming from all different backgrounds, 
all different careers and abilities as well. So lovely to see and so excited to see what the next group and what the next year brings to the program and um, a great class so very excited. Where I'm from uh, there were quite a lot of off the track courses so it became a pretty good option to go into that and I quite like the nature of thoroughbreds they're a bit of a challenge but they were what I was looking for at the time so it worked out really well for me to get my own thoroughbred and I generally just love the breed. I'm quite interested in the weaner education and the whole process of weaning them from their mums. I think it's a really important process to be a part of to make sure that they've got a good start before they head on to the rest of their lives and I think you can make a really good impact on them if you can handle them the right way from the beginning. So I'm quite keen to get involved in that side of the industry. Um, I've had horses since I was a little girl. I've always loved horses, loved everything to do with them. Um, I went into mining just to get myself financially set up um, and now I'm in a position where I can really do something that I love and follow my dream. You can tell the sort of background they've had just by the way they, you know, the way they behave themselves when they come through to us and the different mannerisms you can pick up on them. You can get a good idea of the history and where they've come from through that. Everything you do in those first couple of months from when they're born to when they're weanlings and, you know, yearlings and heading onto the track every single interaction you have with them shapes who they're going to be and how they're going to do in their life. I've had a couple of years experience in the racing industry, um, mainly learnt the bulk of what I've known from uh, Lindsay Park, so I got to split my time between their Flemington base and Euroa base and really learn a lot from uh, Ben, JD and Will, um, they were great people to work for. So I think just working with the racehorses every day, I've always been fascinated by the sire and dam lines and um, the breeding side and stallions and how, how that operates, so I think that's what really made me take that leap. So I'll be uh, at base at Swettenham in um, Ngambi, Victoria, for the uh, Sangster family, so I'm really excited to get down there. I went down uh, a couple of weeks ago and had a look around and met Sam Matthews, the GM, so very excited to get stuck in and start working down there. Um, I'm really looking forward to the foal season. I've never actually seen a foal or worked with young horses. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to be really exciting to maybe get in on a night watch and watch a foal be born. I am heading out to Widden. It's kind of out of town. It's something that I've never been on a stud farm or anything like that. It seems like a big property and um, a lot of horses there, a lot of opportunity in young horses, broodmares, stallions. Um, so yeah, just getting a little bit of experience and seeing what it's like. So I've owned my own horses off the track from a young age and then I have for the last few years been working at Off The Track in WA, which is a welfare program for rehoming and retraining horses when their careers are done on the track. So that's where I've been based. So when I was um, little, I was into riding. My mum had had horses. Um, she didn't want to buy anything per se um, and would rather rescue something off the track and give them a second home kind of thing and live out the rest of their life. His name was Wally. Um, and I just grew up riding him and, you know, just fell in love. I think it's really important for everyone to have that education and know that what they do with these animals does have a lasting impact on them. And if you can handle them the right way from the beginning, that's going to stay with them for the rest of their careers. So it is such an important factor. And the plans for the future, Maddie? Do you want more numbers or keep it at these numbers to give the students exactly the placements and the individual care they need? We have always said that we'll have a maximum class of 20 for this program just to provide that level of teaching insight and that small class size. We always want to continue to grow the program and we'd love to grow it um, to make it even wider around Australia and also of course we've got our other programs and education trainings that we will be promoting this year which includes Stud Start and our management workshops along with TBA Next Crop. So inspiring seeing so many young people passionate about their careers in the thoroughbred breeding industry and well done to Thoroughbred Breeders Australia. Coming up after the break, Arrowfield Stud Strapper Stories. I worked uh, for John Thompson Racing while I was in university and a horse that's very special to me from my time there was a mare called Sweet Deal. Uh, she was by Casino Prince out of Dorothy Evelyn and uh, she meant a lot to me because 
Prior to working for John Thompson, I worked at Eating Glassy and that's where she was foaled. I strapped her at her first two-year-old trial ever and she was ridden by Ty England, which is sentimental. She went on to a race, I think, 48 times, won $1.6 million and was sold as a broodmare to Lustre Lodge. She was a sweet thing, she was gentle. Um, it was my first time working in a racing stable, um, so I gravitated more towards the fillies than the colts. But she just had this spunk to her when she walked. She had great energy and she was just really lovely. She really matched her name. She was bought by Luster Lodge, who raced her in partnership with some other owners, so they bought her out. And uh, she's had a colt by Zoo Star and she's in Folta Written Tycoon and I'm really looking forward to hopefully seeing the, the yearlings um, on the track and, and maybe at a sale where I can see them before they reach the track <laughs> as well. It's uh, such joy that comes with being able to, to know the entire story from, from Foles to, to their first day at, at, at Royal Randwick and Deal. then their success of the career Deal. and now to see that Deal. pedigree on a, a, on a sale page or, or on a race book, it'll be fantastic. That's all for this week on Thoroughbreds uh, Go. Join me again next week as we focus on two of this year's fast track graduates who've wound up in jobs working at the home of Australia's champion stallion, I Am Invincible. That and much more next week. I'm Caroline Searcy. I'll see you then.